Good morning. Good morning. Our first hymn is number 701. When we all get to heaven, you can find the lyrics on our screen or in your hymnal.
Amen. Please be seated. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Mount Zion United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Chris Rapko, the pastor here, and I'm so glad to be with you. There's nowhere else I'd rather be this Sunday morning than with the saints. Amen. I'm happy to be here, and I'm also happy that our conference lay leader, Nate Abrams, will be bringing uh, uh, the sermon for this morning, and I'm just super excited to hear you, Nate. Uh, I'll introduce him properly, well, maybe properly, <laughs> Next, uh, in the next little bit here. Uh, our affirmation of faith this morning comes from uh, page 881, and it is the Apostles' Creed. I realize that we normally stand to say this, so you are welcome to stand in body or in spirit. Sorry to make you sit down. I believe in God the Father, mighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated now. Today is a communion Sunday, and so our welcome and announcements will be short. Uh, and our uh, prayer requests, you can put those into the offering plate when they come by. If you'll write them down, we'll make sure that they get on the prayer list. I thank you uh, so that we can get out in a timely manner today. Uh, I wanted to direct your attention to the flowers. The flowers for this morning are to the glory of God and in honor of Tanika, Tierra, and Tiana. I love you and I'm so proud of you. May God richly bless you. From your mama, Brenda Glover. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, just a couple of short announcements. Uh, this last Tuesday was our uh, monthly food distribution for Project 1213. It went well. And uh, I'm so thankful for your generosity, uh, especially in the canned good donations. Y'all have really stepped up, and we were able to provide all kinds of canned goods because of your generosity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the need is not over. <laughs> we still have more need and we're accepting canned goods, uh, especially veggies and soups and that kind of thing. So keep those rolling in and thank you for your generosity already. Uh, how, many, how many folks did we, were we able to serve this last, this last week? 31 families. Whew. Praise God. Next week, our, uh, our annual conference uh, holds its yearly Wesley Woods Mother's Day offering, and we're going to be participating in that. Uh, if you'll mark your checks next week if you're going to donate to that cause. Wesley Woods is a great uh, ministry of this conference, and, uh, and it uh, specifically uh, does ministry for those who are in their uh, upper years. Uh, and... Uh, and it provides them a place to be in community together uh, in their retirement years. And so um, that offering, the Mother's Day offering, is a big source of their su support for the year. And uh, I encourage you to give generously to that cause. It's, a, it's an excellent and worthy cause in our conference. Uh, and finally, we have Safe Sanctuaries training upcoming before our uh, Vacation Bible School. And so if you will, watch for the newsletter uh, for links to the training. There's a PowerPoint presentation with some videos on it uh, and a form that will need to be signed. And this is for everyone who will interact with our youth and children. Uh, if you volunteer in any way or think you will be volunteering in any way, and I encourage you to do so, uh, please, you, you need to uh, go through this training in order to do that. And so um, for those who are not able to view uh, the presentation, uh, online for whatever reason. Uh, there will be a training after services on June 11th for those who cannot do that. And so thank you for the ways that many of you already serve the children and youth of this church. And if you aren't, 
I encourage you to do it. You're going to get a lot out of it. And now we'll move to a time of prayer. Uh, and before our prayer this morning, I want to invite you to be in prayer for our city, as there was a mass shooting on Wednesday uh, in Midtown, and for Texas, as there was a mass shooting last night. Y'all, um, my spirit is not well this morning. I, uh, I wept a lot this morning at the news. And so I invite you to pray with me and to bring all of our cares before God who does care. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray this morning for the victims of the shooting in Midtown, for their families, for their friends, for the doctors who are tending to them still. We pray this morning for our broken world and our broken nation and our broken city, as most of the, ch of the children in the city of Atlanta, including my own God, were locked down on Wednesday, sheltering from yet another gunman, not getting to enjoy the outdoors and life as it should be, we were terrorized as a city. And yet this terror is becoming more and more normal. Last night, another nine of your children were killed in Texas. And together we ask with the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget us forever? Will you forget us forever? How long will you hide your face from us? How long must we take counsel in our own souls and have sorrow in our hearts all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long will we live in this constant fear that we will be the next ones, and if not us, maybe our children will be? Especially the fear for our children who seem to be targeted more and more. Some of us have feared for the safety of our children for longer than others. We sometimes slide into this assumption that this violence and this terror is normal. That assumption is absurd, oh God because we know that you have not created us for violence, but for wholeness. Not for death, but for abundant life. Convict us, O oh God, that we should act in the ways that give life rather than taking it. When we normalize violence, get in our faces and shake us awake if you need to. Rid us of the sin of inaction. Remind us that it is most often through our hands and feet that you choose to act. When it is us who hold the stones, when it is us who kill your martyrs, help us to drop them. Help us, O oh God, to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you. We pray these things in the name of the Prince of Peace, even Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. prepare our minds and our hearts for our offering this morning. Again, thank you so much for your generosity and the ways that you give to this church, whether it's through Project 1213. Our ushers may come down and forward at this time. Whether it's through Project 1213 or just your presence, your prayers, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And oh, Lord, we need your witness now more than ever. 
Let us pray now as we give back to God what is already God's. Redeeming God, the gifts we bring to you this day, we dedicate to the work of kingdom building. Even more, we offer ourselves as material for this work. Imperfect as we are, we know that with Christ as our cornerstone, that you can build your version of mercy, justice, peace, and compassion here in our midst. In Christ, our rock and redeemer, we pray. Amen. standing for our scripture reading for this morning it comes from Acts chapter 8 7 7 sorry Nate Acts chapter 7 verses 55 through chapter 8 verse 1 it's the story of the martyrdom of Stephen hear the word of the Lord but filled with the Holy Spirit he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, but they covered their ears. And with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all, through, uh, all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Yeah. Please be seated. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for our children's... Really, that's the only sermon I need to give you all, is the, the enthusiasm of the kingdom of God is found in you. <laughs> Running up to join in hearing a word about Jesus. I love it. What do we use rocks for? Yes. Oh, man, I was hoping for that answer, actually. You hit the jackpot. What else? Skipping, yeah, like playing hopscotch. To learn. Yeah, I, I, I got that. What else? Anything else? Okay. Do we, do we throw rocks at people? No, we don't throw rocks at people. This is a lesson that I'm teaching my daughter as well. 
she has a, a hard time remembering. I do. Her name is Jordan. We call her Mini Rap. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> oh, I like it. Um, so we don't throw rocks at people. Yeah, she has a hard time remembering that because she's three and a half, and, and it's fun to throw <laughs> pebbles, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, that happens sometimes. So we don't throw rocks at people, but we use rocks for usually a lot of times for either landscape or building a house. A lot of things are like that. You can either use them for good or we can throw them in the river and they have really kind of no use sometimes except to dam, dam the water. Or we can use them for bad or we throw them at people. Yeah, we don't, th we don't want to do that, right? Right. There's a lot of things like that in life, too, where we can either use them for good or for bad. And God's word for us this morning is that we ought to use them for good. And you are very lucky because you have a whole bunch of people who are around you and surround you and who teach you how to use things for good instead of bad, right? So I want you, whenever you go out into the world and you encounter anything that could be either used for good or bad, to choose the good. And Jesus and your friends and your family are going to help you. Let's pray together. Oh God, help us to do the right thing even when it seems hard. Help us to be good rather than bad. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Or across the street to Children's Church, uh, I invite you to stand up and greet your neighbor and tell them that God loves you.
I'm thrilled to introduce to y'all Nate Abrams. He is a, a friend. He's also the lay leader of the North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church. Uh, uh, Nate is called to serve and to love the church through being a lay person, um, just like most of us here, uh, one excluding. <laughs> Uh, I know Nate, uh, I got to know him pretty well from uh, starting Belong, which is the Bishop's uh, Emerging Leaders of North Georgia, uh, and it's a leadership training program for laity here in, in the North Georgia Conference. Uh, we were part of the, the launch team for that and the planning team, and now have handed that off to other folks, and we're thankful for that, both of us, I think. Uh, and he also, uh, he's an engineer, by the way, uh, and brilliant. And, uh, and, a, and a pastor's spouse. Really, if, if you're not getting this, the man's amazing. Uh, I said in, in our bulletin that he makes Chuck Norris look weak, and I think that's, that's right. And Jonathan, our friend Jonathan Brown would be proud of that statement, I think. Uh, he also uh, runs something called the Atlanta Ecumenical Urban Farm Network. Uh, he's the founder and the executive director of that. And he took a look at our green space across the street and I think got a little green with envy. Yeah, 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 I did. Uh, well, I'm, I'm excited. I, I know he's going to challenge us uh, in, in, in good and, and God-filled ways because every time I hear him talk to me, I get challenged. And uh, uh, I'm just thankful for him coming this morning. I know you will be too. Nate. Good morning, Mount Zion. Good morning. Uh, whenever a friend introduces me, I feel like it's a setup. So <laughs> there will be payback at some point in the future. <laughs> um, it is always a joy and a privilege to be invited to preach God's word uh, wherever I go. I get to visit many places across the conference, and it is always wonderful to be invited into a pulpit to share what God has shared with me. So I am grateful to be here with you. Um, if you will pray with me for just a moment. Gracious God, we come to you this morning grateful. Grateful that we are able to come into this place to worship you, to hear from you, to be challenged by you, to be comforted by you. I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears that we may hear you, open our eyes that we may see where you are at work, open our minds so that we may understand where you would have us to go. And now, Lord, the, the words that are on these page, let them be not mine, but let them be yours for your people. We ask these prayers and we give these thanks in your son, Jesus Christ's name. So a few nights ago, my youngest son and I were sitting at the dining room table. We just finished dinner as a family, and my wife and my older son had, had moved off into other parts of the house to do other things. And my youngest son and I were talking, and I don't remember exactly what the conversation was about, probably something about video games or the latest TV show he'd watched, something like that. But out of the blue, he asked me, Dad, why do you moms sometimes break your own rules? <laughs> exactly, I heard it over here. <laughs> Needless to say, he, he caught me off guard and I fumbled around for a moment trying to figure out what I should say to, to my 10 year old son. And I finally answered him with a question. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> Can you give me an example of when we've broken our own rules? Uh, he's a smart kid, so he had an answer ready, right? He said, well, you tell me not to yell in the house, but whenever you need me and my brother to come do something, you don't come to us. You yell at us to come and do what you want us to do. Gotcha. <laughs> now, I squirmed for another second because what he said was true. When I'm in the front of the house doing something in the kitchen or whatnot, and I need one of the kids, I don't walk back to their room. I yell, and I expect them to come. But 
you know, I, I'm his dad, right? So I can't just say, yeah, you're probably right. I should, probably shouldn't be yelling in the house if I tell you not to do it. And the truth is, I, I could have said that, but you know, parental authority and all, we got, we got to maintain those boundaries, right? So I finally came up with something about maturity and when the rules apply and how to know when you can bend the rules, but I don't think I convinced him. That said, we are not do as I say and not as I do type parents. We try to set a good example for our kids by being honest and having integrity in everything that we say and that we do. So when my son asked me that question, why do you sometimes break your own rules? It caused me to do a little soul searching. And when this text popped up in the lectionary, it all started to make sense. But to understand why it made sense to me, we have to know a little bit about the main character here. It's a guy named Stephen. In the sixth chapter of Acts, Stephen was one of the seven chosen specifically to serve the people. The church at that point was growing exponentially in response to the good news of Jesus Christ. And the sheer number of people who needed to be served was actually starting to cause conflict within the church. The 12 apostles wanted to save themselves by focusing on proclaiming God's word rather than serving tables. So they prayed and they chose seven well-respected men who were endowed by the Spirit with exceptional wisdom. To put this in, in Methodist terms, the apostles served kind of like elders. They preached the word and they taught and they led the people into learning more about God and about Jesus. And the seven who were chosen served more like deacons. They were called to actually serve the people and to lead them out in doing the word. The text tells us that Stephen was gifted. The Bible says in chapter 6 that he stood out among the believers for the way that God's grace was at work in his life and for his exceptional endowment of divine power. Now we know, all know how people can be sometimes when someone shines, when someone is exceptional. Folks got jealous of Stephen. And because the church in Acts was still in a tug of war with the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem, you know, they hadn't quite separated out yet, a few of those jealous people went and made false statements about Stephen. And they ultimately had him arrested, tried, and executed. But what did Stephen do to deserve such a death, right? He was just serving people in the church. The beginning of Acts chapter 7 tells us what, th about that. It's the story of his trial. It's the story of what he said to the Jewish authorities that so enraged them that they had him dragged outside of the city walls and stoned to death. I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but in short, when asked to defend his views on Stephen, on Jesus, Stephen instead told them back their history. He told them how God had raised up Abraham and promised to multiply him into a great people. He told them how God had heard the cries of the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt and how God raised up Moses to deliver them from that captivity. He told them how God elevated Joshua to finally lead them into the promised land itself. He told them how Solomon had built God's temple in Jerusalem and welcomed the Lord Almighty into a home. He told them all of these great things, but he didn't stop there. Stephen went on to tell them about how the people had misbehaved in response to God's grace. You stubborn people, he says in verse 51. In your thoughts and hearing, you are like those who have no part in God's covenant. You continuously set yourselves against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. Stephen held up a mirror to them, and he asked them why they didn't obey their own rules. 
that he asked them why they demanded that people do as they said and not as they did. Stephen presented hard truths to the Jewish authorities, and they didn't like what they saw. What do we do with those who hold up mirrors to us? How do we respond to those who tell us hard truths about ourselves? What do we do with those whom God sends to hold us accountable in our spiritual walk? These are the questions that Stephen's death brings up. He wasn't killed just for loving Jesus and serving people. He was killed because his witness presented inconvenient truths that made the people in power uncomfortable. I wonder, do you hear echoes of Jesus' death in Stephen's story? Jesus was someone else who told inconvenient truths to people in power. He was someone else who knew his people's history and was unafraid to recite that history to unearth present wrongs. Jesus came to offer salvation, yes, but before he saved, he challenged. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. These were Jesus' words in Matthew 10. They were words that were meant to disturb. They were meant to unsettle people. They were a warning to any who claimed faith in God but didn't act like they had faith in God. Here in the season of Easter, we tend to focus on the resurrected Christ. But all around us, there are people who are suffering for holding up mirrors. All around us are those who are being persecuted for telling us about ourselves, about our history, and who are asking hard questions of us. Are we who we say we are? Are we following our own rules? Are we demanding that others do as we say and not as we do? Who challenges your sense of right and wrong? Who or what enrages you? And in that rage, is it holy? Is it an anger that spurs you to build upon the work that the Holy Spirit is already up to? Or is it a rage that entices you to reject those who question you and your beliefs? Here's the danger in rejecting those who challenge our worldview. In rejecting Stephen, the Jewish authorities embrace Saul. The text says that Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. And that shortly thereafter, the church became the subject of vicious harassment. We all know who Saul eventually became. But before he was the apostle to the Gentiles, he wreaked havoc, arresting and killing Christians just because they proclaimed the name of Christ. In rejecting and in killing Stephen, the leaders embraced the violence of Saul. Those who offer the greatest challenge, those who ask the most uncomfortable questions, often they are also the ones who point us in the direction of the greatest redemption. God sends us people to hold us accountable to our faith, both individually and community and communally. Who is telling us hard things about ourselves? Who is speaking to us now? I wonder. What was the young man who shot those five people in the doctor's office in Midtown this past week? What was he trying to tell us? The homeless person with the God bless you sign next to the freeway. I saw someone on the way here this morning. What are they trying to ask us? What are migrants trying to say to us? The Democrat, the Republican, the conservative, the liberal, the protester, the police officer, the preacher, the teacher, anyone who offends you the most, what is it they are asking you to think about? And more crucially than what they're asking, how are we responding? Do we reject them for the mirror they hold up to us? 
Or do we see the movement in the, of the Holy Spirit behind the discomfort and embrace that movement? Do we deny what we see or do we turn and repent? Don't reject those who ask hard questions. Don't reject those who reveal difficult to swallow truths, especially if they follow Jesus. And especially if the gifting of the Holy Spirit is clear upon them, don't reject them. Our text says that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. His anointing was clear, but it says they closed their ears. They rejected him. It's another little echo of Jesus there, huh? The people saw clearly who he was, and they said, No, thank you. Let us not be those people. Let us be open to hard questions. Let us be open to questions that may turn us down a different and more faithful path. Let's be accepting when someone shows us how we and perhaps even those who came before us have been wrong. We may squirm a bit. This is not easy. This is one of the hardest things that we are asked to do as people of faith. We may fumble around for the words to make sense of our actions. We'll be profoundly uncomfortable when confronted like this. Uncomfortable, perhaps, to the point of repentance. And that is a good thing. So, as for me, I'm going to make an effort to stop yelling in the house. <laughs> I started practicing this morning. I'm going to get up from whatever it is I'm doing when I need my children, and I am going to go and find them and speak to them in a decent time. I'm going to turn from those old ways that my son laid bare at the dining room table and embrace something new. That's what this faith is all about, after all. It's about showing us where we have sinned, showing us not so that we can feel guilty and feel bad about ourselves. Showing us so that we may repent and turn more fully to God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We may not like the messenger. In my case, I did. And we may not like the message. But if we are to call ourselves Christian, we must accept that message. I pray that each of you hears what the world Stevens are trying to tell you. I pray that you embrace the challenge in their message, and that you don't shy away from the truth and the mirrors that they hold up to you. And I pray that whatever it is you see, you repent and go and do what the Spirit is calling you to do. In the name of God the Father, Christ the messenger, and the Holy Spirit who empowers us to go and do good in this world. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymnal to page eight.
brought them out of slavery. He brought them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And then he disobeyed. So he sent the prophet, and the prophet told us, here's what you look like. Here is a reflection of yourself. And still he sinned. We stoned the prophets. We killed them because they told us what we were like. And so God, you know, wouldn't stop, wouldn't take no for an answer because God is always determined to save us from ourselves. And so in the very, at the very right time, God sent Jesus to finally hold up the ultimate mirror to ourselves and say, this is what, what you look like, and this is what you're supposed to look like, me. And we killed him. We killed him. We've sinned. And the good story, uh, the, the story of God the Creator and God the Father is that God will never stop coming after us. In our sin, God will never stop. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. And the Hebrew writer says he will forget our sins and remember them no more. So let's join together and confess our sins so that God shall forgive them and that we can come to this table clean, pure, justified. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means that you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> in the name. Glory to God. Amen. Jesus Christ did some special things. Including loving even his worst enemy, the one who would betray him. I can't, oof, I can't even with Jesus sometimes. And yet, I know I'm called to be like him. I know I'm called to forgive even the worst of the betrayers. I'm called to invite them into the table so that they can know and be changed. They can know God intimately. That's what we do at this table. We remember the God who came down in the flesh, who changed us forever. On the night that he was betrayed. The betrayer was at the table with him. He took the bread and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after he broke the bread and distributed it and said all that, he, he gave thanks for the cup as well took the cup and said and gave it to his disciples and said drink from this all of you this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me and we relive this we participate in this every first sunday and as often as we do it wesley said by the way that we should do it as often as we can 
And there's a good reason for that. It's a converting practice. We encounter the grace of God every time that we commune together, every time that we have to look each other in the face and say that you are a child of God, and so am I, and oh, aren't we blessed because of it? That's what happens at this table. It's a mystery. It is a holy mystery that this can happen. And so we say these words, that this memorial acclamation, which is the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And we say that because it is a real mystery of faith. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Easter is always a crazy thing for me. We're still in Easter tide, by the way. But it's always hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that Christ will come again, I think. We understand the previous parts, but we just don't understand what it's going to be like. And so to help us until Christ comes again, as we walk this mystery of faith, God sent the Holy Spirit to guide us, to di direct us, to sanctify us, to move us toward wholeness, to be our guide and our comfort and our advocate. And so we ask the Holy Spirit now that he would come down. It's actually, it, the Greek is neuter. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to come down and bless us to make us gathered here be the body of Christ, the one body of Christ, the holy body of Christ, the apostolic body of Christ, to make us one. And also to pour out upon these gifts of bread and juice to make them be for us the body and the blood of Jesus so that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed. We ask that God would make us one. Simple enough, right? And I think we know that it's hard work to be one. Help us, Holy Spirit. Come and visit us and convict us when we know we're wrong, and even when we don't know that we're wrong. Help us to admit that we are and to do the right thing. We pray these things in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Methodist table. It's God's table, and specifically Jesus Christ's table. And he invites you to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. All are welcome. Once you come.
Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for meeting us here in this mystery, this holy mystery, where we are reminded that we are your children redeemed by your grace. Amen. Lord, we ask you to give us clean hands and pure hearts as we rise from this table to do your kingdom's work. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we give you thanks for your grace and your mercy. Empower us now to go and serve the world as you would have us to do. Amen. As we remember your sacrifice, oh God, help us to go and live sacrificially for others. Help us to pour ourselves into the others around us and give them life. Thank you for giving us life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Lord, as we thank you for our many blessings, we also ask you to keep us ever mindful of the needs of others. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as you remind us of your grace and of your goodness, help us to be a source of grace and goodness as we go out of here as well. In Jesus' name. Receive now this word of benediction. Go into the world and look at your reflection. Look at the people who hold up the mirrors to your face and don't reject it, but take it in and say, Lord, I know this is from you. Help me to change. May God give us the strength to do this. This is not an easy task, but by the grace of God, we can. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve. Amen.